is the Rural Behavioral Health Learning Collaborative, our first meeting. And I would just like to welcome you all, and I'm so glad that you all are participating. This is Shannon Robshaw with the TA Network. Um, Ray Baudre with the TA Network and I, our contact information is there on the screen. We're our primary points of contact for the Rural Learning Collaborative, and, and we are thrilled to get this kicked off today. Um, we're, the purpose of the, of, of the learning community is to bring together those that have interest in or expertise in children's behavioral health in rural areas. And the way we envision the, this learning collaborative uh, working is to have bi-monthly webinars. This is the first. Um, um, it'll be, they'll be on the first Friday of the month, and we'll share expertise and promote peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, hopefully through having some experts come in and give, give their perspective on particular topic areas and then eliciting feedback from um, sites around the country. We also have established a listserv for the Learning Collaborative. If you've registered for this webinar, then you're automatically been placed on that listserv. If you would like to be removed, just don't want any more emails coming in your inbox, just let us know and we'll take you off. Um, we'll be periodically sharing resources and information through that listserv. And if anyone out there would like to share um, resources, we would, we would love for you to send them our way to either myself or to Ray. Um, we, have just, we, we did take a poll uh, many of you participated in a couple of months ago to identify some initial topic areas. That's how we ended up um, focusing on the opioid epidemic for this first webinar. We also have identified topics of partnerships with faith-based organizations, partnerships with primary care practices, and network development um, issues and mobile crisis implementation are some areas that we think we'll probably be focusing on in the coming, uh, coming months. Uh, so if, but if you all have additional particular requests or topics that you would like to see us um, to look into or to explore, or you have some recommendations about some particular programs or, or experts in the areas that I mentioned, please uh, send that information along as well. We would, we would love to have that. Okay, so now I think let's just jump right in. I'm going to introduce our two presenters today. We have David Lambert, who retired in the fall of 2014 as an associate professor in the public health program at the Muskie School, University of South Maine, where he taught courses in health economics, mental health policy, and public health policy for children and families. He directed the evaluation of the Northeast and Caribbean Child Welfare Implementation Center, which was funded by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Children's Bureau. In this capacity, he helped design and monitor evaluations of participating state and tribal projects. He has more than 25 years of experience conducting mental health services, research at the state, local, and national level. This includes studies on integrating primary care and mental health, rural mental health outreach, dual diagnosis, recovery models, best practices, of mental health managed care in rural areas and other things. He served on SAMHSA's National Advisory Work Group to Reduce Stigma in Mental Health and is past president of the National Association for Rural Mental Health. So we're thrilled to have him here. And his co-presenter is John Gale. And since joining the University of Southern Maine's Rural Health Research Center, rural hospital and delivery system issues have formed the core of Mr. Gale's research. His work concentrates on the operation of rural delivery and safety net systems involving critical access in other rural hospitals and includes studies on the role of hospitals in their communities, including their community needs assessment, engagement, benefit activities, performance improvement, and population health initiatives. His other research activities involve rural health clinics, primary care and behavioral health integration, behavioral health issues, use of health information and telehealth technology, program management evaluation. He serves on the Board of Trustees of the National Rural Health Association and New England Rural Health Roundtable. He's a senior fellow of the Health Research and Educational Trust of the American Hospital Association and adjunct faculty member of the Public Health Program at the University of New England College of Graduates and Professional Studies. He recently completed a Rural Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Toolkit for the United Nations to support policymakers in developing countries. So we thank you very much, John and David, for being with us today, and look forward to hearing from you. 
Okay, so I'll jump in um, and welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to talk to you about work we've done on opiate strategies. You know, it is, um, I, I think it's safe to say that there is no one in this country uh, or very few people that I, I know of that have not been touched by this opiate problem. It's an incredibly difficult challenge and it affects all walks of life. And I think what I've tried, and as I think about this and apply sort of the lessons of healthcare to, to this current situation, one of the challenges that we see is that it's an incredibly complex problem and it really sort of typifies what's wrong with our healthcare system and what's challenging about our healthcare system to be a bit more positive, is that on one hand, and the good thing about opiates and Oxycontin and all of these medications, is that there are a class of prescription meds that are very, very important and provide very significant benefits to a very uh, select group of people. And these are patients with acute severe pain. So it can be people with bone cancer or severe neurologic damage or sort of crushing traumatic injuries or intractable chronic pain. But the number of people who need Oxycontin and the very strong prescription medications is a first a choice and a first line response to pain is is less than you might think. I mean, so on the bad side of the ledger, we have the influence and un which undue influence of drug companies, and their job is to sell us medications. Um, and we don't, and we have not been successful in putting any control on the drug companies uh, as we uh, in in our society. Uh, there was an early failure among the studies and among those who were reading them to acknowledge the risk of prescription opioids. It's important to know that the harms related to opioid use are not solely to those who misuse them recreationally, but rather everyone who takes them can be at risk. We have very slow adoption of evidence-based prescribing guidelines. We know that physicians are not always comfortable and they prescribe more than we should. And at the same time, we have a growing demand, uh, patient demand for opiates. Uh, many, many patients and many individuals are less comfortable with the idea of, of being uncomfortable. That, um, that, that they believe that controlling pain means eliminating pain. And so that's part of the problem. Right, and just let me add, this is David, um, Part of the problem is that for many years, I think there was a lag in, in terms of getting enough knowledge or in, out there about the existence of the problem. But I would dare say that in the last few years, knowledge of the problem really isn't the issue anymore. But as you were saying in the slides, John just said, it's the complexity of, of the problem. And which means that for states and communities, what do you do given these so competing interests, if you will, and forces at play, uh, both clinically, policy-wise, and politically. And then we have a comp you know, we have the corresponding complication is there is a direct linkage between prescription opioids and heroin use. They're much more interrelated than one people understand. That if you you tamp down on the supply of one, the other will get increasing use. It wasn't that long ago in Maine that we spoke to individuals who were without health insurance and suffering from work-related injuries. You know, people in the extractive injury, industries of fishing and lumber, uh, farming, m uh, mining, um, were using heroin uh, to control work-related pain for injuries because it was substantially cheaper than buying, uh, buying a prescription medication without insurance. And I, I think it's important to recognize now that in many parts of the country, you couldn't buy lunch for what you can buy heroin for. It's five, six, seven dollars a dose and it's incredibly inexpensive. So with that cheery context, we'll jump into some of the things that we know about this. But you know, I, I think it's always important to keep in mind this is an incredibly complex problem that while it's now relevant to many of us, and I would argue that that it has become more relevant because we've the problem looks a lot like most of us on this phone. People with from all walks of life, from all backgrounds. And so it is no longer people in the inner cities or 
as it used to be when uh, when oxycontin was referred to hillbilly heroin in the in the Appalachians and other regions. So, sort of background information: it, opioid use is the primary cause of unintentional um, drug overdose deaths. That it is not uncommon in many rural states, such as West Virginia, New Mexico, New Hampshire, and Kentucky, that the, uh, the these are the rural states are higher in the uh, highest rates of overdose deaths. Um, opioid overdose deaths uh, from opiate use now exceed car act car deaths by car accidents in many places. Um, there was a, an article oh, six months ago. Um, in Huntington, uh, West Virginia, there were 26 cases of opioid overdoses within a four or five hour window of time. And it was tra tracked basically to heroin that had been cut with fentanyl. Mm -hmm. But you're now seeing it popping up everywhere. Yep. Um, it's uh, higher among, and we, we understand at least in rural areas, that higher use or misuse of pain relievers is higher among vulnerable rural populations. These include youth, women who are pregnant uh, or experiencing intimate partner violence, persons with co-occurring disorders, and felony probationers. As we mentioned earlier, heroin use, which was primarily associated with urban location, has migrated away, and you now see it in small, small urban areas, non-urban areas, uh, rural communities, um, and they're very closely linked. So I, I'll skip over quickly uh, some of the work from our study, but just very, in, a, in a nutshell, we use the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. Uh, which is the one big data set on substance abuse and behavioral health disorders uh, that we have. Um, they have approximately 56,000 respondents each year that make it into the public use file. Uh, there is a more class, there is a more robust uh, private file that has not been released as yet by SAMHSA. I know they're working on the access issues, um, obviously for purposes of confidentiality. Uh, they they are, take this very seriously, so it's a complex process. And I'll go over some of the numbers. You know, overall, and uh, past year opiate use, and that would include, um, and opioids include both heroin and prescription meds. It's slightly higher among urban persons and rural persons. That's chart. Uh, the scale is a little misleading. It's 4.3 percent in rural versus 4.7, so a little under 5 percent have used in both areas uh, opiates in the past year. But as I mentioned earlier, there are folks with social demographic vulnerabilities that are more likely living, rural people who are more likely to have used opiates than others. And these are youth 12 to 19. Uh, people in fair or poor health have lower levels of education, have lower incomes, and tend to be uninsured. And one thing is the context, you know, in doing research and from rural, often we say, oh, let's compare rural to urban, which one's larger, which one's smaller. And another way of looking at it, which I think applies to a lot of the data we're now sharing with you, is that if it's a problem in both, it almost doesn't matter which one's bigger or larger. If it's, if it's significant in both areas, which it truly is, then how do you understand what some of those contextual er issues are? in rural, which is, of course, what we're looking at today. And I, I think as important is that if you look at these things sort of nationally on an urban-rural basis, that's one issue. But if you start looking at a community level or smaller levels, the law of small numbers is what prevails. And that, that depending on supply issues or um, you know, culture, the drug the composition of drugs and the use of drugs will vary. We know that some communities will be heroin, other communities it might be opiates, and still a third uh, opioid prescription meds, and a third it could be a very specific type of opioid prescription med. And so what's really important to understand is that for there are people who are more vulnerable on a socioeconomic basis um, are likely to, to be at higher risk. 
and that in understanding what's going on in your communities, you really have to look beyond the national averages and begin to explore the, the contextual factors in the community. Um, and so some of the things that we are also seeing in this survey, um, rural heroin users are less likely than urban to perceive risk in trying heroin at least a couple of times. So at least, uh, you know, and that's dangerous because if the people most likely to experiment with heroin uh, are younger folks with, and they perceive the risk to be less, they, they have a, a smaller barrier. To, to using it. Um, we have roughly similar proportions of those using uh, both, uh, injection drug use in rural and urban areas, very slight differences. And those um, that rural people tend to have some slightly higher levels of risk in terms of drug use. Uh, risky drug practices. So, uh, slightly, uh, at least in urban areas, a few, uh, slightly more people are, are likely to reuse their own needles. Probably a little less risky in rural areas. They're more likely to use some, reuse someone else's needle by a small amount. Um, rural people are also more likely to report someone else has used their needle, and they don't clean them with bleach before before reusing them. And we will talk a little bit. At, later about a particular comment, a particular community, I should say, where this has been an issue. Our rural opioid users are more likely to have been involved with law enforcement. They're more likely to have been arrested uh, on probation or driven under the influence of illicit drugs or alcohol the past year. So they also engage in slightly more risky behaviors. So uh, we have a poll question, and we'd ask you to um, respond, so what is the extent of opioid problems in your use? You know, we're actually we're looking not for quantification, but rather a, your impression in terms of uh, how much of a problem it is. And that's jumping in, and uh, we're over, or well over two-thirds are saying that it's either a significant or ec epidemic problem. Yep. So um, clearly an issue. So roughly 67% think it's significant. Almost 7% say it's an epidemic problem. Yep. Uh, there's not a person on the poll who reported that it was not much of a problem. And uh, I think actually scans very well with what you know, more precise real you know, survey data we do have. I think that's what that's that's pretty trend. consistent for yeah. us too. And we have the next on uh, which are the primary problems in your community. So we're coming close to the end. So we're seeing, um, again, not surprising, about 8% are reporting, a little over 8% are reporting heroin, uh, same number for prescription opioids, and uh, the vast majority by a significant margin, almost 84%, are reporting that both are an issue in their communities. So thank you very much. Yeah. Something is amiss with our slides here, so let me see what I can come back to. Yeah, there we go. Great, thanks. So factors associated with opioid use. Um, we control for residents, age, sex, race, ethnicity, health, you know, all the sort of normal factors. Um, rural persons were less likely to use opioids in the past year than persons from urban areas. However, if you look at age groups, 12 to 19 year olds are much more likely, 70% more likely to use opioids than those who are 30 to 49. I guess apparently we do get a little more co uh, rational and have a bit more common sense as we're older. Males are 30% more likely to use opioids than females. 
and the, those in poor health with limited education and are uninsured have higher odds of opioid use. So we're starting to suggest a little bit maybe some pathways or focal points to what we end up doing about it. So if we look at it from a rural perspective, rural persons under 30 had higher odds of opioid use than rural persons 30 and over. Uh, rural persons who were married had a 40% reduced risk of using opioids compared to those who were not married. And the rural uninsured had a 58% higher, higher, higher odds of opioid use than those with private coverage. So if you're not insured, um, again, the pathways are poverty and, and other risk factors. And so, you know, David, we're going to jump in with me. If some of the policy issues really are, um, if we want to make a difference in opioid use, we have to begin attacking some of the social vulnerabilities. And if you look at, at what uh, the, the, all the literature tells us, that um, socioeconomic dis, uh, disparities are associated not just with substance use, but behavioral health, and a wide range of health issues. And in many respects, beginning to attack these problems are going to be the biggest contributor to health right, in our communities at a variety of levels than almost anything else. Right. And then and we'll talk, I guess, more about this later when we get to more recommendations and share with you all what might be going on in your communities. It means that it's not just these vulnerable populations or uh, you know, people with these uh, vulnerabilities uh, that, that we want to exclusively uh, focus on because, you know, as, as we know from the literature and elsewhere, it cuts across all groups. But these are the more, more likely starting points and ways you might get traction. And as an advisor even now, to start thinking of your own communities and, you know, as you move forward and saying, so what do we know? Where, where is this happening? And where might be the points that we can start, you know, getting some traction? And so if you think about Prevention is an important strategy. It's clear that we've not really penetrated the rural areas as well, that young men, young people and young men who uh, are more likely to be less concerned about the risks of heroin and opiate use. Um, we also know from other work we've done in rural communities that young women and mothers uh, who may be in in difficult uh, circumstances are more likely to use. We know of places like North Carolina where they've undertaken very significant family-oriented problems and, to and prevention and treatment programs for young women who are pregnant because that is an issue for young mothers who are using their children are automatically and by default uh, impacted by their use. And one other thing, if you recall back a uh, few slides ago, we don't need to go back, but you know, how um, high the, the use is among the 12 to 19 year olds. One of the practical things is that if we have younger children or teenage youth, not good, but at least many of those uh, children and adolescents might be you know, uh, in our service system so we have access to them. A problem that we have is you start getting into that transition away from from adolescents into young adults is that often, unless they're in the formal system, you know, including the criminal system, they fall off uh, you know, out of a reach or out of where they know to get help, you know, that, that trusted person to speak to. So there's an additional vulnerability as they're aging, even within that 12 to 19 year old group. And you know, some of the other policy implication, harm reduction, prevention, treatment, uh, prevention efforts are important. Um, syringe exchange programs are important. We'll talk about a very specific case shortly, um, but they're far less common in rural areas. Um, this is a slide that, that is up for grabs at the moment because we don't know exactly what's going to happen with health reform. Um, uh, we're seeing nationally that, that the, uh, there will be efforts to change and, and revise the ACA how much of that stays in and how many of the benefits for uh, and coverage for people with opioid use issues remains to be seen. So I think this is something to watch. So let's, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the rural communities. 
Um, we know uh, substance use is a longstanding issue. Um, if you go back to the 90s, the, um, when OxyContin first started coming out and it was uh, really being touted as a, a problem, it was known as hillbilly heroin because people could uh, access it through the emergency department, through their doctors, they were grinding it up and injecting it, and it was a real issue. Um, as I mentioned earlier, though, we, see, we have seen that heroin can be a substitute for prescription meant because the, obviously the chemical action in the body is the same. You know, there, are, there are issues around purity and people adding things to it that are problematic, but um, we know that, that it's a, they're much more of a classic economic substitute than most people would like to think. Um, there are major initiatives in many rural states, uh, Vermont and Ohio are a couple that come to mind, and we will talk a little bit about specific state strategies that we've observed. Heroin is cheaper, accessible, and stronger. Um, I, I would dare say that, that it's easier to find than many other drugs. Um, and then our non-medical use is highest among rural youth, women uh, who are pregnant, uh, experiencing private, this domestic partner violence or have co-occurring disorders. So here, let me talk a little bit about one of the challenges that we see uh, in terms of, of opioid, prescription opioid use. Uh, and we were talking about this before the presentation started, yeah. that we, uh, we have supply issues in this country. And by supply issues, we have too much of it going about. The United States uses roughly 80% of the world's OxyContin. Physicians in the U.S. prescribe at twice the rate of physicians across the border in Canada. And if you look at the prescribing rates in, in the United States, that, that we have very significant differences in prescribing. The, with the lowest prescribing states, um, prescribing substantially less than the highest prescribing states. The difference is one to three. So, uh, so if you look at this and those geographic patterns tend to follow parts of the country. Yeah, very contiguous. So in particular, the highest rates of opioid use are in the, the south and some of the Midwestern states. Uh, if you look at this, this map, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, the Carolinas, Kentucky, uh, Michigan, um, Indiana, Ohio, and West Virginia. Um, it's important to note that um, the three highest states, I believe, in, ter uh, in terms of opioid prescriptions are, um, I believe, Alabama, Tennessee, and West Virginia. And so while one might argue that there are variations in health conditions, if you look at in many of the southern states, we have lower health care access, we have greater rates of poverty, uh, many of them are involved in work-related work injuries um, from mining and farming and other conditions, but I don't know that that, that level of, of difference accounts for a three times different rate in prescriptions. A lot of it is cultural, a lot of it is physician practices. Here's another way of looking at this. The highest states and the lowest states in terms of the number of prescriptions filled per 100 people, um, Alabama, West Virginia, Oklahoma, Tennessee, and Kentucky, with the highest rates of prescriptions being in Alabama and Tennessee. They prescribe, uh, if I can read this properly, uh, they write, uh, the physicians in those, or prescribers in those states write 143 prescriptions per, uh, for opiates per 100 people, compared to 63, 60, 52 with the lowest in Hawaii. And I'm, um, there's a question, um, does the data on variation of prescribing rates exist for Puerto Rico? in other U.S. Ter territories? Uh, that's a good question. I suspect there may be, but I would have to take a look at that. Yep. We can make a note. We'll try to, and we'll get back and we'll send it to the West or through the center and get back to you on that. So thanks for that question. Yeah. Yeah. And there also might be, yeah. So I, I um, had done some work recently in Montana uh, 
And so let me, and I, I thought it was helpful to use, to use Montana as a context for some of the things that are going on. One of the uh, very, very important tools uh, that, that are available for use to, to combat excessive prescribing practices are prescription drug registry programs. In many states, they, uh, most states have them. I yep. think there might be one or yep. two that, that does not. But they basically have been around since the early 2000s, um, and they encourage pharmacists and prescribers to log their prescriptions and then physicians to check them and prescribers to check them before uh, prescribing an opiate. So in Montana, it was authorized in 2011 by the legislature. It became functional in 2012. And here's one of the issues. It's voluntary for prescribers, mandatory physicians. So if any physician who fills a, a prescription for an opioid has to log it. Physicians who are prescribing them do not. They're also not required to check before using, before prescribing medications. And this is a simple tool that, that is so important. But prescribers have access. Individuals who can look, want to look up their own records can in Montana, Mexico, Medicare, um, Medicare, excuse me, Mexico, sorry, Medicare, Medicaid, Tribal Health, Indian Health Services, and VA. Uh, law enforcement. Uh, can access them with subpoenas for an active investigation as well as licensing board. And there's an interesting history there, and probably your state might be similar. So that in Maine, where we also and I did the evaluation of our first few years under Maine's uh, prescription drug monitoring program, um, they were voluntary. But the idea is that if you force uh, physicians, at least when we first implemented, to do it, like many of us, if you absolutely tell me I have to do it, I'm very busy, you may be less likely to do it. But if you make the tool available, you educate uh, folks, and you encourage it, uh, it's more likely to take. And they found that, in fact, that did happen, at least for the first few years, but then it hit its sort of natural leveling off point. Then, as pressures increased in terms of prevalence continuing to go up here of, of use, there was more pressure. Uh, uh, on, on physicians and prescribers to use it, and then it wasn't just voluntary. Uh, and then also law enforcement sort of gets caught. And so, as we were saying earlier about it's a complex issue, even when you have tools, and we know in the long run, tools usually work best with education and not being totally coercive or absolutely required, if you will, um, you, you get the cross pressure. Do you let it gradually increase, or do you want to push the needle a little bit, uh, push the envelope. And I think that's the sort of um, conundrum we find ourselves. Uh, you know, how do you make it know uh, work? We, we have the knowledge. We have different tools. How do we make the best use of it? Absolutely. And what we're also finding is that you know, the concern is that if you mandate use, then prescribers in rural communities and other places that have uh, have limited uh, capacity and resources. Going to just time and resources yeah. to do it. Yeah. We've heard complaints from providers who say it takes time. They have to go in and log in. Some states won't, won't allow right. a designated staff person to check. It has to be the doc themselves. Right. Um, obviously, one of the things I think we can do, and we're not there yet, is to use the health information exchanges to um, to expand use. Um, some states that share uh, borders. Will make will track and allow use back and forth across the borders, but not everyone. So, you know, if, if I'm here in Maine and I'm traveling to Seattle, um, you know, my records don't and my use of opiates, uh, legitimate or not, may not follow me to Washington if I move there. So, really, to exchange this information becomes very important. Uh, so, other things in Montana in 2014. Uh, Montana reported um, 125 overall overdose deaths, 12.4% per 100 population, with the national average of now, at that time, we were almost 15. Uh, Montana being a slightly lower prescribing state, it had a rate of 82 prescriptions per 100 people. Uh, but the, the number of people seeking treatment for heroin or morphine use has jumped. It was 26 in 2007. It's up to 313. The people in treatment are typically white, adult, and male. Um, 
Interesting that the drug arrest rate on Montana college campuses is four times higher than the median state average uh, arrest rates um, in nation, national averages, I should say. So it's for almost five, uh, five arrests per 100 uh, per thousand students compared to 1.08 nationally. There's something going on where the uh, use of uh, drug, drugs and the arrest rates in Montana college campuses are higher. It could be a function of greater enforcement. It could be a function of greater use. We're not really sure. So I, I, I'm going to jump into a case, a little bit of a case study, which I think is very, very important. And it just is an example to show that for those people who think it can't happen in their communities, it can. We're going to talk a little bit about Austin, Indiana. They're in Scott County. It's in the southeastern part of the state, I believe, down near Tennessee. There are 4,200 people living in rural Scott County, and they have the perfect storm of HIV use under Governor Pence. And uh, there were, uh, during a six-month window in 2015, this town of 42, this community, county of 4,200 people, excuse me, had 169 new cases of HIV in six months, 268 cases of hepatitis C, and 80% um, of those people were co-infected with both viruses. And so what caused this? You know, it, it, it was a huge public health crisis, was in the news constantly. It was tracked primarily to prescription or IV drug use of a prescription medication known as Opana. Opana is a relatively newer uh, synthetic opioid. It um, is time released and modified so that it's harder to abuse. And so instead, it, the, you can't abuse it orally the way you might with heroin and, and pure forms of heroin. But people then were grind, grinding it up, cooking it down, and injecting it. Uh, Scott County in, in Austin, Indiana had high rates of poverty, unemployment, and insurance. And this drug was, and they were on a major drug transmission uh, pipeline. And so people were using this um, because of a relatively uh, conservative cultural environment and legislature. Uh, there, was, there was a ban on needle exchanges. They were not allowed. Um, there, were, there was a moratorium implemented by the legislature on new opioid treatment programs. I think at the time there were 13. They were mostly uh, commercial, organ, commercial entities, uh, private. Uh, they didn't take health insurance. They didn't take Medicaid. Um, they wouldn't bill patients. They, they was a cash-only business. And so um, there's a huge problem, and it was until about six months into this outbreak that the governor realized that he had to do something and was getting a lot of advice from his public health advisors and declared a public health emergency, which has now been expanded to, I believe, three or four other counties in Indiana, which allowed him to suspend the moratorium on, uh, opioid, on uh, needle exchanges and implement one, implement one in, in those counties that have been declared public health uh, crisis spots. Yeah. Uh, they've also, the legislature has expanded and allowed additional, I think up to five more opiate treatment program, opioid treatment programs, and they have to be located in either a not-for-profit hospital or a community mental health center. Um, so that was one of the issues. One of the other challenges that we saw in talking to clinical folks in the community is that now um, they were not able to offer buprenorphine services. Um, the physicians had enough on their hands. Uh, patients primarily have to drive to Indianapolis to get uh, treatments. Um, but their biggest struggle was how, how to deal with the very large number of cases of HIV. There were whole families that were exposed and now infected with HIV and HCV. And their, their clinic in town was being viewed as that clinic for people with HIV, and it was turning others away. They had very little access to infectious disease support, and so it's a huge problem. They also have no recovery programs. The point they made, which I think is critical, is that when um, someone is, if someone's able to get treatment, they return to the community, 
They're, they've typically burned most of their bridges. They've probably stolen from their family. They've been involved in legal issues. And so people know in a small town, they know who you are, the whole issue of stigma, and they fall back. They can't get jobs. They can't uh, get past where they, they were, and, and they, they tend to relapse. Yeah. And you see in that case study, and thank you, John, I mean, all these things, again, coming together. I mean, you have sort of a cultural take of the situation. You have politics, if you will, at a large level. And you have all these service delivery issues and also the nature of, of rural communities, as John said. And both sort of getting them on the table so you can have that conversation and then start, you know, again, doing something about it. And stigma is still a significant issue for this problem. And it doesn't matter whether it's uh, prescription meds or heroin. Uh, there is a substantial... Uh, problem the stigma both as a, a barrier to doing anything about the problem from prevention and treatment but also from those individuals suffering from this you know, in these issues to see yeah, and stigma is so stronger for substance use across the board including alcohol than it is for be mental health uh, and it's pretty successful for mental health as well but they have a long history of, of this deeply ingrained uh, views that yet uh, that we can have and of blaming people, you know, for the sort of weakness, if you will, for, for using it in the first place. So in terms of looking at some of the rural barriers and challenges, uh, things that we've identified from our work, um, we see, can see, we've seen issues with state and local interagency collaboration, is difficult in low resource environments. We see workforce limitations uh, in rural communities. There are fewer specialty behavioral health providers. Uh, access to substance abuse service and treatment and recovery is limited. Uh, stigma, which we've mentioned, there are a view of many uh, the view substance use as a moral failing rather than a disorder. We still tend to criminalize it, and I'll say up front, we cannot arrest our way out of this problem. This is we, uh, the war on drugs is not an effective one. It, um, and, and continuing to view this from a law enforcement perspective is not going to help us. And finally, we, we need to work with local primary care providers to bring them up to speed on proper prescribing practices because it's an issue. We have to tamp down on supply wherever we can. Yeah. And just, you know, amplify John's point about we can't arrest our way out of a problem. Interestingly, some of the more innovative and successful programs around the country, uh, some rural, some in you know, Seattle, have actually been initiated by law enforcement that realized they were getting overwhelmed, even though they were getting people off the streets, that wasn't uh, really diminishing the problem. And that they still need, a, you still need law enforcement. It's not like it goes away, but that's not going to solve the problem. And, that, and they, law enforcement will be the first to tell you that. So poll question, um, who are the key players engaged in efforts to address opioids in your community? Getting to the end of this poll. Just give you a minute or two more. Yep. So uh, it looks as if we've settled in. So roughly two thirds of, you, of, of those of you who responded have said that law enforcement is a significant uh, player. Public health, a little over half. Primary care providers, about a third. Especially mental health and substance use providers, again, not surprising. Schools, about a third. Local government. The faith community, which is important, at almost 50%, and other at 20. So thank you. But I do think it shows that, that it does take a wide range of stakeholders, and not any one group can tackle this problem alone. So we're going to talk a little bit, um, excuse me, 
there was a question after that, was it? There was just one question. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so someone has been yeah. interested to in know, uh, we think law enforcement is doing so from a supportive space for criminalization. Um, I can tell, we'll talk a little bit about both issues in a few minutes, but we'll, we'll, move, we'll re circle back to that. So in terms of community strategies, and as, as I've been around the healthcare system for a long time, I remain increasingly convinced that we need to activate and engage our communities in solving these problems. They have to be addressed at the local level. Policies will be helpful. Supportive regulations will be helpful. Systems in place. But if there isn't a culture at the community that takes on this problem and begins to address it, then we're not ultimately will be as success, successful as we like. Um, and we are seeing some comments in the box. And if we'll circle back a little bit, we are. Um, there will be a PowerPoint on legal on legal strategies and law enforcement strategies shortly, but we are seeing folks that are saying that in many communities, law enforcement uh, is paying attention, but primarily, uh, but often from uh, criminal uh, focus on criminal activity. But we will, in a few moments, get to that. So some of the issues related why community strategies are important. What are the important components? They need to be broad based. Uh, as we saw from the poll, we need a, it takes a village, we need a large group of people to be engaged. We have to focus on issues of stigma. And I think that focus really becomes a lot easier to understand when, when you begin to understand how many people in our communities, including parents, children, and family members, have been touched and impacted by opiates. It's a whole lot easier to look down on folks when they're not yourself and you're not your family. So I think there needs to be a, a willingness to talk about these issues and not hide it. it it's difficult. It, it's, it's a heartbreaking challenge for any family, but the ability to be open about this is very important. Um, prevention is critical, broad-based, from the schools, from employers to providers, uh, even prevention activity of uh, being able to dispose of medications. It's surprisingly, in many communities, it's hard to they don't, if you don't want to flush them down the toilet or throw them away, which is what a lot of people do and not recommend it, there's no way to do it. Oftentimes the, the take-back programs operate once a year. So you may sit with prescription meds in your, your medicine cabinet for the better part of a year before there's an opportunity. Um, we need harm reduction both in naloxone, which is the anti-overdose uh, anti drug, and needle exchanges. Engage law enforcement that avoids criminalizing users. Engage providers that are willing to use evidence-based prescribing practices and maybe take a less easy approach to medication and pain management. And finally, very, very critically, we need peer support and recovery services. Save that. There we go. Uh, we'll talk about one program, but there are others that we could share with you. Um, this is Project Lazarus out of North Carolina. Project Lazarus uh, was developed by a, um, by a hospice director who was also a minister in uh, Western uh, Wilkes, um, Wilkes County. And um, they had a problem with overdose deaths and needle exchanges in the community. There were people who were dying. But at the same time, this hospice director was noting, noticing that because of the pushback around overdose deaths, that it was harder for his patients who were in the terminal stages of their lives due to cancer and other disorders, uh, they were having a hard time getting their prescriptions filled. So this is, it was a huge problem. And the Raleigh, uh, the um, RJ Reynolds Foundation has taken this on and they supported funding to develop this model in every county in North Carolina. And it's been adopted in, in a variety of count, uh, count, counties across the country, uh, places, uh, and we'll talk about them in a minute. It's an evidence-based national model. Uh, the core components are public awareness of opioid misuse and community issues. It requires broad-based education, use of local data to drive awareness, coalition building and, and action, uh, programs tailored to local need, and a process to track progress and build sustainable support. So the um, 
it's it's a sort of a two-part component. There, there's one that they want every community to do, and that was the first set of activities around education and prevention. Uh, then there are others based on local needs, which use uh, prevention initiatives that reflect sort of a medical or a law enforcement-based top-down approach, public health approach. So it's community education, provider education, hospital emergency department policies, drug diversion control. Pain, patient pain support programs, harm reduction, and addiction treatment. There are other communities. In this program, I, I've had the chance to talk with people who are doing this, uh, but there are versions of it uh, that have been adopted. In, uh, I think the, the 2015 uh, Pennsylvania uh, Rural Program of the Year was Project Eagle in, uh, in the northern part of the state. That has adopted a, a Project Lazarus style model. We also have others, such as Project Vision in Rutland, Vermont, which has had a huge issue with heroin. Um, and we we've invited a group of yeah. law enforcement officers. This is where we get into this concept of law enforcement in a supportive way. Um, they were very very focused on stamping out the problem, not chasing down low level. I, and I, by that I mean drug users who are struggling with their lives. But, but the impetus to that program, because we, we have actually worked and collaborated with them in some presentations, these folks also go around nationally a, a, a lot as well. You might have heard from them. It was originally actually about four or five years ago when all of a sudden uh, their, you know, their crime rates were just continuing to climb. Uh, in part, the economy of the area you know, has declined, so that might have led to it. But the burglaries, and and robberies and things like that. And so at first the reaction is they will describe was, you know, okay, you know, more police uh, patrolling on the streets, if you will, arrest. But then when they start to really dig down and look, start looking at the data, they realize, wow, because of, of, of the opioid use, uh, again, we can have more police uh, out there, but that in and of itself was not going to stem the problem. There's uh, a lot of community policing community engagement. One of the strategies that I, they told us about that I'd also heard them, I heard this discussed on public radio out of Boston, is that they oftentimes can't, don't have the evidence to arrest the significant drug users. These are people coming down the pipeway, pipeline from Montreal down to Boston to New York, is that they would yeah. sit with a, a brightly uh, painted po police van. The office, two officers would sit there, they'd park in front of the apartments right. where drugs were being sold. They couldn't go in. They didn't have the evidence, but they they were clearly chasing folks away. The other thing that they did by sitting there with the windows open and the doors open and sitting, um, people would walk by and talk to them, and they'd get information on what was going on. Yeah. And, they, and the people who lived in those neighborhoods, which had been really uh, battered badly, began to trust the police yeah. again. They almost like back in, as they described in their own words, back into community policing, you know, it, which wasn't necessarily their explicit idea. They just wanted to deter, as John was saying, the, the youth. And, and then that's when, as they described, the light bulb sort of went on and said, maybe this is the way we, we need to make some connections as well. Exactly. And so there are other examples. So the community strategies are absolutely critical. And we'll move on because I, I know we're starting to run a little, uh, we're about an hour in. Yeah. And so we have another polling question. So what are the barriers to developing community-based strategies and interventions in your community? Yeah. yeah. What are the big problems? <laughs> but uh, I have to say, having visited with these folks from Project Vision and Project Lazarus, uh, the three officers they sent down um, were just, it, it was a very much an eye-opening experience because they saw this as a way of taking back their communities. You know, they and the problem is they said when they were in their arrest mode, they were arresting their neighbors and their neighbor's children or their neighbor's uncle or, and they began to see that it was not, these were not career criminals that, and, and that arresting them wasn't solving the problem. So they, while they couldn't always arrest the major drug dealers, right. they began to make their life so difficult that they no longer wanted to stay. And right. while there was some, one of the people who I heard interview them say, well, you know, isn't that a problem? I mean, they just go someplace else. And they said, well, they might. But all we can do is worry about our 
So what we're seeing, public funding is obviously one of the big barriers. Third party reimbursement, uh, 25%. Political community oppositions, surprisingly about a third of the people are noticing this. Turf barriers among agencies, stigma. Uh, limited access to treatment services at 83%. Uh, lack of prevention expertise, lack of recovery options, and others. So again, thank you everyone, but it, as you see, it could be a number of issues. So state strategies, you know, we, we talked a little bit about communities, and I would encourage you to look some of these programs up on their websites. Project Lazarus has a set of toolkits that are freely available to anyone who wants them who are interested in undertaking their community strategies. And I would be the first to say that you can use their tools. You can modify them. The key is to get a broad-based group together that it doesn't have to necessarily follow solely exactly their way, but adapted to your own needs. But at a state level, the other problem we have is understanding how do we begin to put policies and the like in place. And we see a couple of different ways to do this. Um, thank you for putting that, that up. And, um, and there's been some comments that, that you know, one individual, and Christopher mentioned that his community is on a major drug trafficking route, and law enforcement struggles to separate our people from the serious cartel types, and that's mm -hmm. a good issue. Yes. And they're not always going to do it perfectly, but I think over time they, they will work on, they can work on that. So as we look on at, at state strategies, at the top level, you need a multi-level task force that brings all sectors of, of the state involved. This includes mental health and substance abuse agencies, uh, state police, um, the attorney generals, um, oh, physician groups, the hospital associations, the medical associations. And the example that we look at was in Indiana. Uh, they had a prescription drug task force that was implemented by the governor. Uh, oh, actually, I'm sorry, that was implemented by the, the attorney general's office. If they had over 100 people on this group. They had legislators, law enforcement, medical professionals, pharmacists, federal, state, and local government agencies, educators, advocates. I believe they had members of the faith community involved. So they, they brought as and users were, uh, substance users were involved. And so very widespread. And they developed basic committees. So they had five committees, education, enforcement, inspect, which is their prescription drug monitoring program, take back which is a uh, disposal site program in treatment and recovery. And we think you know, it, it's incredibly important to bring all of these sectors involved because there aren't enough resources for anyone to go alone. And um, that, like many things in this world, if you attack it from only one perspective, then it's going to pop up elsewhere. Right. And just a, 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 a we saw a comment for Christopher's question about law enforcement and trying to separate, the, if you will, the cartel or the the heavy professional drug dealer for, for other things going on. And well, Jen and I, uh, I guess my was first, were involved in a local initiative uh, through the mayor of Portland uh, to basically address uh, substance use in the, for the opioid use here in Maine, and in which uh, our, our Portland police chief as well as our uh, um, county sheriff were very, very involved, actually, almost every meeting. and. Clearly, what you hear from them, as well as from the folks in Vermont that we talked about, uh, the law enforcement still wants to get with the you know, quote the bad guys or I guess bad whatever the bad people that are doing that. You still want to get them off the street and in jail if you can. Uh, sometimes that's difficult, uh, but sometimes you can do it. But they realize that is sort of only one part of the problem, and then it's sort of not uh, either or. You want to do that, but you also have to do this community piece, and they sort of go together and make as much progress on both fronts as you can. Um, and traditionally, until more recently, I think law enforcement kept on trying to just get the people off the street, you know, and, and put away. Uh, so, another approach is to engage the agency and program heads at the state level, and this comes from the state of Washington, which has been an incredibly effective. It's an interesting model because it's the example of a state that has taken a more state-level uh, regulatory approach to opioid prescribing. The, 
the problem first came to light from the director of the workers' comp program in the state. And as you imagine, many work-related injuries involve um, physical trauma and a higher than typical rate of opioid prescriptions. And he began to see this problem. So they pulled together all the agency medical directors. And these include, included uh, state veterans organization, uh, Medicaid, uh, workers' comp, and um, hospital and licensing and, and, and certification. And they developed and led the development of prescribing guidelines, which they update regularly. And that has been huge because it, they had a more consistent approach to prescribing uh, guidelines and adoption because they work so heavily at it. And if you're going to participate as a provider and bill for services under uh, under any of these programs, then you're required to follow the guidance. Um, the other program, which is one I think is fascinating, is that they also uh, convened an interagency task force that's focused on uh, emergency department prescribing practices. If you think about where people, uh, if they're going to drug shop, they they aren't likely to go to a local primary care physician because those folks know, uh, know their patient base. They might go to uh, community clinics, but they typically will wait till the emergency use the emergency department late at night uh, or on weekends or off hours in the hopes that they're able to get their medications. So they pull together agency heads and hospital representatives, and they develop this extensive guidelines for uh, ED prescribing. They were approved by the hospital association members, and they created the concept of an oxy-free zone, which is really very interesting. Um, they, uh, they will announce that they will no longer routinely use oxycontin and oxycodone as first-line uh, treatments for people with coming in with back issues or ankle injuries or like. Um, they won't refill lost prescriptions. The, uh, so if someone comes in and claims to have lost their prescription or has legitimately lost their prescription, it's not to say that everyone is always trying to take advantage of the system, they won't refill it. They might give a patient a couple of pills to get them through until Monday morning, at which point their own prescriber can, can refill it. Now, there has been some pushback. Many of you may be aware that, that there are some it's called the HCAPs, which are consumer satisfaction, patient satisfaction measures, one of which was pushed by the drug industry that called for the uh, developer of the question that asked whether how adequate, how well your patient prescribed your pain. And some hospitals that went to an oxy-free zone um, noted that they received some hits and, and some deterioration in their, in their HCAP scores in this area. While that's a problem, I think the industry and, and third-party payers are now understanding that this is a flawed measure and that any scores coming back that are less than perfect in some ways may be shown, may be viewed as a is fact that prescribers are doing the right thing, but it also should trigger some sort of a, uh, investigation or a quality improvement project to figure out what's going on. In some cases, the providers may be doing a less than ideal job of uh, managing pain, but in other cases, it may be folks who have unreal expect unrealistic expectations of what they should get when they do visit an ED. So it's good, and it's, I think it's worth exploring, and we're seeing other hospitals. I, I recently talked to an administrator in Michigan. The upper part of Michigan is doing the same thing, and they find substantial reductions in cost of uh, unnecessary prescriptions, uh, over less uh, service use, and I think the Washington documented uh, significant multi-million dollar savings from uh, avoided use of unnecessary prescribing practice, uh, prescriptions. Another state strategy, um, and earlier on in one of the polls, one of the issues we noted, it was noted, is the lack of specialty substance use treatment services. And so uh, we know that in rural communities, there are lower, the lower penetration of specialty services. And one of the things that many of you may be aware of is that SAMHSA now has a waiver process that allows prescribers, uh, family docs, and others to be trained through about an eight-hour training program uh, 
to receive a waiver to allow them to use buprenorphine in practice settings. And buprenorphine is a partial opioid agonist. It's similar in action in some ways to methadone, which is a full opioid agonist. Uh, buprenorphine has a little less but still abuse potential, but it can be used in primary care settings. Now, that that's we've had that for a while. I think the latest change is that, that with time, providers can have up to 275 opioid patients on buprenorphine in their practices. Um, but what we're finding is, despite the the training, a lot, a few, many fewer providers are actually prescribing in their practices. It's a lot of work, and it requires some coordination that may not always exist. So in Vermont and in other states, we're beginning to see what's been called the hub and spoke model that pairs and links opiate treatment programs, especially practice uh, behavioral health and substance use providers with primary care practices uh, to help them access the traditional substance use treatment programs and helps to address their, uh, their dual diagnoses um, and some of the health care issues. So it involves, Vermont has Medicaid funding to do this. They have a Medicaid waiver and they uh, provide comprehensive care management, care coordination, referral to local resources. They help with care transitions. They, they providers who are willing to prescribe buprenorphine if they hit certain targets can actually get two staff people assigned for and paid by Medicaid to support their practices. And that's a real issue is how do you work with these folks. So you get a care manager, a care manager and a nurse, uh, nurse manager to support the practice. Um, but it has allowed a substantial increase in the number of providers who are willing to not only uh, use buprenorphine in their practices, but expand uh, expand the number of patients they're willing to take on. But I think it's important to look at this because it recognizes the importance of both mental health and traditional substance use services and trying to do the best you can to use scarce resources in a less stigmatizing setting. And finally, a couple of system strategies that some of you may or may not be aware of and that is Project ECHO. And Project ECHO is a telehealth-based uh, program that has evolved, evolved at the University of New Mexico, but is also being used across the country. And honestly, it's being used, I've, I've observed it being used by, the, by uh, providers in India and Africa and Asia and other places. I believe there's now a, tele, a Project ECHO site in Afghanistan. Um, it's basically a virtual case management and case conference. I'll explain one, describe one at the University of Washington School of Medicine. There was a physician in the tr uh, primary care training program, uh, um, Roger Rosenblatt, who has since passed away, uh, found that as he was sending med students out to rural communities for their practicums, they were having an incredibly difficult time um, they would come back and say that, that all they did was manage opiate prescription demands from people who were hurt. And he, if you thought about this, he created this program, and they call it Project Rome, which was Rural Opioid Addiction Management. And they used technology to, to run case conferences that would last six to eight weeks, and the providers were, and they would have specialists who would do a lot of training around opioid pain management use and how to use buprenorphine. Uh, providers who from the community could present case conferences, they could get, they created peer-to-peer -peer relationships. But it's one way of, of expanding access. It's not a treatment program per se, but it does support providers who are willing to take on these difficult patients. Now, the challenge is it's not third-party reimbursable and funding. I think Project Rome was funded initially with tobacco funds and it cost them somewhere around $125,000 a year. When the tobacco funds went away, Unfortunately, with Roger's passing, and uh, he passed away a couple of years ago, the sort of internal champion uh, was lost, and they they have discontinued funding. But others across the country were seeing that that Echo was being used by many others. And now we'll jump into a legal strategy that uh, some of you mentioned earlier on, and we promised to circle back to this. Um, there's a project in Gloucester, Massachusetts called Project Angels, and it's been adopted now 
you'll see in a few minutes, uh, in a variety of communities. And the physicians noted that they, I mean, the physicians, the police departments were noting that they were running into problems with a large number of young people and community members who were being arrested. So they created this program. If you're an addict, you walk into the police statement with your uh, police station, excuse me, with your supplies, and ask for help. You can you can be helped and not charged. So you're paired with a volunteer angel who helps to walk you through the process, and the individuals uh, are moved through a process of getting rid of their drugs, assigning them to an angel who helps them through the process, and working towards detox and recovery. Uh, they work with Addison Gilbert and the Leahy Clinics, who are two big multi-specialty provider practices out of uh, the central Massachusetts area. Uh, they commit to fast-tracking people to get them in the door. Um, they're also making nasal and Narcan available to reduce opioid overdose deaths. Um, they're being made available in local pharmacies without prescription, and the police departments are paying costs. Yeah. And, and there's elements, you know, we're not going to go through all these other programs around the country, just enough time, but uh, an element that's common to a lot of them is, is, is the notion that you walk in and you say, I have a problem, or here it is, and you don't get arrested, because obviously you have to be able to get that access for people to be, you know, willing to, to come forward to get to, to start to get help. And there are exceptions to the yeah. process. So people with an outstanding arrest warrant don't, aren't given a, a pass. Um, if you have three or more drug-related convictions, um, oh, or one with possession with intent to distribute or traffic in a school zone, right. uh, you're prevented from participation. Whether the officer or the watch commander express, has some concerns about whether or not the angel who's helping is safe, um, if the patient is under 18 and doesn't have parental or guardian consent, or they're presenting with clear symptoms of withdrawal or medical conditions that, that would be unsafe for them. But, you know, it's a really interesting program. And here are just, these are the countries, the, the communities across the country from a variety of areas that have taken this on. Now, unfortunately, the, there's been some sort of political turmoil in Gloucester, and the police chief has been discharged. Well, but I don't think it, it undermines the value of this program. But, but um, I'm in here, but I think it also gets back to this complexity that we started, I think, one of our first slides. And uh, for those of you who wanted to do something in your community or already are doing something in your community, people are sitting in different positions getting different pressures. And I won't name the program, but there's a program in New England, you know, around the community that was trying to address this, and they actually had a substantial amount of foundation money there. They just had to get different people to sign off on it. But, but one of the you know, you know, working elements of the program was the idea of, of not automatically arresting people when they first showed up unless they had some of the, these other situations that John just enumerated. And in the end of the, you know, at the end of the day, the district attorney wasn't in a position to be able to sign off on it. And while he or she might have wanted to, depending upon where you fit, and um, did not have the degrees of freedom or, or, or the discretion to sign off on that. So again, it's because you know this issue is looked at different ways. Uh, it impacts different systems, and there's just frankly different pressures on all of us depending upon where we sit. But the more communities work together and talk, you really can move forward on it. It's just not just saying A, B, and C will get you there. It's an ongoing process. Exactly. Thanks, David. The, um, some of the ongoing challenges, we're getting down to the end, and we want to leave time for some questions. And we have yeah. one last poll. We'll, we'll ask you to type some information into the, te into the response boxes. So we, uh, we know there's poor coverage for medication-assisted treatment. Poor opiate treatment for all levels of people, including children, uh, and young people and adolescents and family members. Um, Medication-assisted treatment uh, in combination with traditional substance use, mental health, and outpatient treatment programs uh, is substantially more effective than not using the Medicaid opiate, the MAC. Uh, so that, and it, it's clearly an evidence base that's important. Uh, we know that services are clustered around with urban centers with long travel distances. We know that buprenorphine providers often operate below capacity, and that you need all these other services. And, and for a provider who is, MAT means um, medication-assisted treatments. So methadone, buprenorphine, uh, naltrexone, and uh, naloxone. Naltrexone uh, is not 
does it, it's not an opiate agonist, but it, it's an antagonist that will help accelerate the treatment use in the body. And, um, and naloxone is the drug that breaks very safely opioid overdoses. Um, and then greater attention is needed what happens after treatment. Peer support and recovery services are critical. People need to be able to go back to their communities and rebuild their lives and step past the things that we mentioned earlier. And it's no surprise people who have drug use problems, drug use disorders, uh, frequently have burned a lot of bridges. And they are stereotyped. And we need programs that give them an opportunity to move out of the people and the peer grouping that got them in trouble allow them a hope of finding a job. If you think that, if you remember that substance use is so often uh, linked to socioeconomic conditions and a lack of hope and a lack of way out of their current situations, you go back to your rural community, you can't find a job, and everyone uh, is not willing to give you a break. It's not a recipe for success. And finally, the community is the key. I would encourage you to think about Project Vision and Project Lazarus and other community infrastructures as a way of engaging your community members in beginning to address opioid problems. You can, and by working as a community, you can leverage pressure against providers and hospitals. If one provider is, is prescribing excessively, most people in the community know it. You can work with one another to, to make a difference by engaging providers and schools and yeah. residents and law enforcement. The faith-based communities are huge. Um, school programs. Um, conducting broad-based education on the dangers of opiates. You'd be surprised how many people don't know how bad it can be. And maybe there are alternatives to pain medication. Uh, build a local system of care that integrates and supports prevention and recovery. Recovery starts before treatment oftentimes. You have to get people ready and you have to support them so that they can engage in successfully complete treatment. And what, we have one last discussion and uh, ask if you might, if you have examples of successful and promising community strat strategies targeting children and families, if you could type the name of the program in the brief description in the text box. And if I remember correctly, um, though that list will be made available to all of you following um, following the, the call. We have about five or six more minutes, so if you wouldn't mind uh, typing in those examples, that would be great. Or if you have any specific questions that you would like uh, to ask either David or, my, or David. Or yeah, my. and if we can't get to them in the limited time today, we'll be glad to somehow get them back to you either through email or, or posting them, or we'll figure out a way to, to answer your questions the best we can. And so some basic information. Um, this is our center. David and I both have worked for some years now with the uh, Rural Health, uh, the Maine Rural Health Research Center. We do uh, a lot of work in this area. Um, and we have a number of publications. These are also available through the uh, Rural Health Research Gateway on a variety of rural topics. And my contact information, please feel free to contact either David or I, and we will get back to you if there's sort of specific questions. And so we're looking to see if examples are coming up. But um, thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And have a really good weekend. We get to it. We'll be keeping thank you, David open. and John. And I, this is Shannon Rob, so I'm just going to close this out. And um, I just also wanted to make you all aware of a webinar series uh, being sponsored by SAMHSA and AIR and on these topic areas. If you would like to participate in those, you can go to this um, website, this link, and, and register. And also, there's on March 23rd at 2 o'clock Eastern time, there's going to be a social marketing webinar targeted to rural and frontier, frontier areas that the notice should be coming out in the um, TA Telegram. It's going to be sponsored by the Care for Every Child Mental Health Campaign and the, and the TA Network. So those, those are coming. Um, coming along too, so please avail yourself of those. And we will, if you have additional questions for John, 
or David or us at the TA Network, um, feel free to contact us directly. Uh, we can also, if there are resources or recommended programs that John, that John and David asked about that y'all identify, we can uh, get those out through the listserv as well um, if y'all want to get those to us. Any final questions for John or David before we adjourn? Well, thank you. Uh, I, if there are no other questions, we do appreciate um, your time. Um, and as we say, I think the as frightening as the opioid problem is for rural communities, and we've seen it devastate communities. So the HIV problem in Austin, Indiana, Girl Scott County, um, the problem with heroin in Vermont, it, it really had an old town that that there were whole neighborhoods that were being decimated. The level of crime and, op and heroin use was just staggering. And um, it's important to that they've been able to really take back those neighborhoods. Uh, we are seeing um, a comment uh, that Kimber Falkenberg has, has reminded us, which I, is helpful, and thank you, is that if you're working with young adults really got to include them in the development program. Uh, they, and it's a point well taken, and thanks for the reminder, that um, these, these young people are at risk for substance use disorders and need to be considered. Uh, what works for me as a slightly older adult than I think I am is not going to be the same, and you really need to get at the input for young young adults and young people in a way that lets them have their voice, and that may mean doing focus groups with them alone that lets them talk. Now, you have to be a little bit careful around the parental issues and uh, and the like, but it's clear that that what may work for adults will not always work for young people. It's understanding the world and the pressures that they have to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. And that's an excellent point. No, it's a, a good reminder. Thank you, Kimber. Well, John and David, thank you again for sharing your expertise and your time with us. It was very informative, and we really appreciate your time. It's our pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. All right. Bye-bye. And we will we'll, we'll continue.